The following is a special video presentation of the Hennepin County Library. Welcome to a discussion with author Barry Lopez. I'm Steve Benson. Barry Lopez's most recent book is Field Notes, published by Knopf. Barry Lopez won the 1986 National Book Award for nonfiction for Arctic Dreams. Among his other books are Of Wolves and Men, Winter Count, Crossing Open Ground, and Crow and Weasel, which of course was performed as a play here in the Twin Cities. Barry, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Steve. Well, first of all, you resist the term of uh, being labeled as a nature writer. Why? Um, I, it's, it's either too specific or too broad. Um, uh, nature really includes everything, so everybody's, in that sense, a nature writer. And for somebody like me to be put in that category doesn't help anybody understand what I do. And to be in a category where I write about natural history, that's not what I do either. So the term's too, too imprecise. I think what I see now in the 1990s uh, in, in theater, in sculpture, in painting, in music certainly, and in American literature is a resurgent interest in the relationship between people and the places that they live, whether those places are cityscapes or or, or countryscapes, open landscapes. And so th the term that seems better for, for somebody like me is a landscape write writer in the sense that there's a land, you have a landscape painter and people understand that landscape painters are people who use landscapes to, to address questions historically that painters have addressed um, for centuries. I think the questions that I'm most interested in are questions that I've been writing about for 30 years, which are issues of human dignity and uh, the nature of, of human prejudice toward other peoples, toward animals, toward the physical world, um, the, the qualities of love that we bring to our daily life, a love for each other, a love of place. And because of the way I grew up uh, in a, in a, in a non-urban environment, in a in a countryside in Southern California, when I was an impressionable child, I, I learned about the world by looking at places like the Mojave Desert or, or Zuma Beach on the Pacific Coast or, or uh, you know, riding my bicycle with friends in the Santa Monica Mountains. So all those years later when I, when I began writing, I wanted, like any writer, to address the important issues of, of, of my people, of, of my culture. Um, what is the relationship between the individual and, and God? What is the relationship of the individual to the rest of the community? Those big questions, which I, I'm not a philosopher, so I couldn't sit down and say, well, here's what I think about that. Um, those questions pushed me right back to the place where I felt comfortable. So if I went north to write a book, uh, well, actually, I went north and then wrote the book. It didn't work the other way, uh, like Arctic Dreams. Um, I stuck very carefully with things that I could discover, like, like polar bears or the, the history of, uh, of Arctic exploration. And those were my materials. But I hope what I was trying to get at was, in that book, was the relationship between imagination and place. How does a place like the Arctic shape the way we imagine everything? How does somebody growing up in this part of North America, in Minnesota, understand phenomenon uh, phenomena all over the world in terms of this landscape, which has very little vertical relief, but in which people feel very comfortable with terrific horizontal space. It's very different from the country that I live in, in Oregon, where the trees literally 10 feet from my back door are 200 feet tall, and I cannot see the stars unless I'm outside looking straight up between the trees. I never see the sunrise, I never see the sunset, because I live in a forest. I can't see it rise or set unless I go down to the river and wade out in the river because it happens to be in an east-west axis. You often write about characters who live on the margins of life. I, I actually, I never thought of that. And, and uh, 
for the sake of it, I'll say yes, that you're right. Because I, I'm thinking of Teal, the anchorite, the hermit. Yes, James Teal. Uh, characters who um, live at the edges, that's right, you're mm -hmm. right about that, I think. I, it, what fascinates me about them is we're focused so much in our society on so-called celebrities or important people that are at the center. And they're not nearly as interesting to me because they are reflections of, of every magazine and every advertisement around us. There, there's very little difference between you open a magazine and there's an advertisement. There's a story that, look, that reads just like the advertisement and here's the television personality that looks like the advertisement and the story. That's not very interesting to me. What's interesting to me is say driving out of the cities way off into the country up to Bemidji or go up to Ely or up on the Iron Range or something like that and just wander around and meet people who are, they're not marginal, they just don't participate in this, um, in this homogenization that that's brings people and, and advertising images so close together. I, I go ahead, I'm sorry. Then, then when you have people who live in deserts, in yes. the Arctic or the Antarctic, yes. Uh, those are the margins, or, yes. the, or the shore, where the, yes. where the sea meets the sand, and, and where you really test the character of that human being and also his inter interaction, then his relationship with that very harsh nature. I, I th it, what you find actually in biology is um, uh, there, there are areas that biologists define as ecotones, mm -hmm. where the ocean meets the land is an ecotone. Uh, there are two different ecosystems that come together. And what biologists find is that the rate of evolutionary change, the likelihood of something new turning up, is highest at those places. So where the forest meets the grassland, that's another ecotone, and that's where you look for new stuff happening. So it could be that almost subconsciously, when I sit to write a story, I always find my w I'm thinking you're, that's very true, this book in particular, Field Notes, there are characters who are right at the edge of the Gulf of, of, uh, of, of California and the Sonoran Desert in Mexico, or uh, a character in the story called Pyriland in northern Greenland who's right at the edge of a fjord uh, where the tundra meets the, the fjord. Uh, and in Pyrrha's tapestry, the climax of the story comes when this woman becomes, uh, when she takes her own life is one way to describe it, I guess, in the river. But I, I, I think that people's, um, I am so stimulated by the rise of imagination in another human being. And, and, you t and the character talks in the story of going out and wanting to talk to the hermit, wanting to yes. really question, hear this man's stories, but he's not quite able to do that. And then when he finally does make the leap, it's too late. He's missed uh, those Well, I don't know if it's too late in that story. Here, here's a situation where a little boy watches a man move into his town, and he's fascinated by that man. And he says later that when he's away at college, he remembers that man, and that man is as brilliant in his imagination. He remembers the first time he saw a harlequin duck, that brilliant male harlequin duck. And he said, this man stayed in my imagination. And over time, as he comes back to the town, he remains fascinated by the man. And you're right, he never has a conversation with him, and the man does die. But at the end of that story, I think what happens is the narrator realizes that he was drawn to a man of virtue. Mm -hmm. And that man of virtue has entered his life, the narrator's life, so that right after his death, the man is thinking, I want to take what I got from this man and go back to my wife and to my daughter and, and bring that quality of love that I'm now infused with into my life in my family. So the truth of that story has entered his life. Yes. I want to ask you too about that. Uh, you've been quoted in other places as saying that you don't tell the truth, but you tell a story, and if you tell it as well as you yes. can, then it becomes true. I, I, I believe the notion that one man or woman can tell us the truth is preposterous. Um, we're social creatures, uh, and the best we can do is, is, is discern vaguely a path toward justice, say. But it requires everyone's thought to find a good path. So when you sit down as a writer or an artist, I think you delude yourself. You're going to tell mm -hmm. the truth, the, the big truth. The best you can do is to use your skills to create a set of relationships that form a pattern. And a reader will say, that, that feels like the truth to me, the set of relationships. So the truth ends up being of the big truth with a capital T. 
it's in the story as, as a pattern rather than as a statement. And a person who reads in various places and sees a play or walks with a child has access to different small truths, all of which confirm the larger truths that a person guides their life by. Um, I, and I, it, to, to, to jump ahead, I guess, to something like what is the difference between truth in fiction and truth in nonfiction? I think what, what you do as a writer, or what I do as a writer, I am asking for the reader's time. And out of respect for the reader, I have to, I have to deal truthfully or honestly with the reader. So if I'm working in nonfiction, the reader is asking maybe in a gentle way, let me know pretty soon what y if you've done your homework. If if the pieces that you're fitting together really go together, and if you're careful with the specifics. So it's a sort of factual truth that becomes the basis of trust between the reader and the writer. And in, in uh, fiction, in it's fiction, that psychological truth. Or what I would call an emotional mm -hmm. truth. If I read a story, say a s I read a story that's set in, uh, in Wyoming, and a man and a woman are driving along, in this and they're having a conversation about why their relationship has turned sour. And the man looks out the window, and he sees a pronghorn antelope jumping over a fence. I would know that that is that's virtually uh, impossible. That that is going to happen in Wyoming, because through my childhood, one of the things, one of a million things that I learned, as like the million things that you learned, is that pronghorn antelope go under fences. They don't jump over them, although although you might guess that they do jump over. If I'm reading that in a story, and I see that the relationship between the man and the woman discussing their, their, their problem in the car is emotionally true, then I just, I just say, well, that guy never went to Wyoming and just keep reading. <laughs> but if this guy is writing a story about Wyoming and telling me about Wyoming, and I see that that's wrong, I think, you didn't do your homework. So you, I in the two forms, you, you must have a re the reader must have a reason to trust you. And I think in one area, in nonfiction, the reason to trust is, um, is that the story is factually true, as, as well as you can manage that. And in fiction, it's emotionally true. And I think another difference um, is that when you read an essay or an article or a nonfiction book, it closes clearly. It closes like a major chord. It ends. Whereas with a piece of fiction, I think the story finishes in your imagination, some moments or maybe even a couple of minutes or a day after you finish reading the story. The, the reader is, is the person who, who, who emotionally brings a short story to a close, whereas it's the more the writer that's bringing the thing to a close in a work of nonfiction in an essay. I'd like to hear a sample of your reading, and let's take a wonderful story about a man, a botanist, who's alienated himself he can't remember the names of the flowers in his own garden and in yes. his own woods. This, uh, this is a story called Homecoming. And uh, in the story, a, a young man um, has spectacularly good luck and writes an article that becomes a seminal article. Everybody quotes him. And on the basis of that, he becomes an international speaker. And he's got lots of uh, consultation fees. And um, he's, he's quite, he's taken up with himself. And he loses contact with his daughter and his wife. And at this point in the story, um, he's lying in bed at night with his wife. And his daughter's asleep in another room. And he realizes that he's not going to be able to do this anymore. He's going to, he's either going to, he's going to have some kind of emotional death or he's going to have to find his way back. So he says to his wife, Alice, he says, do you know where Haskin is? Haskin is the name of a, it's a reference to a man who wrote a, a guide to wildflowers. So he says, Alice, do you know where Haskin is? Haskin, the flower book, it's in Madeline's room. It's, it's in the stack of books on her table. I'll be back, he said. He pulled on his pants and shirt and put his shoes on, sockless. The spine of Haskin's wildflowers of the Pacific coast gleamed in the reflection of the night light on his daughter's small table. He knelt by her bed. Please, Maddie, forgive me, he whispered. He rose and went softly out of the room. 
He sat at the kitchen table for half an hour looking at the photographs and reading the descriptions and names of the flowers on the worn pages. He closed the book, took a flashlight from a kitchen drawer and went out. The moon was full behind an overcast sky. The lawn was wet with dew. When his eyes adjusted, he took the path that he'd walked with his daughter days earlier. The first flowers he came upon were western trillium. He leaned down and fingered, and fingered the leaves, the last few wilted flowers, once white, now purple. He came next to a patch of helibore. He saw it sidelong in the dimness. The woods grew darker. He squatted at several places on the path, but he had to guess at the flowers that came under his searching hands. At a clearing, there was more light. He recognized purslane and wood sorrel. He lay on the ground to bring his face close to the soil and inhaled the cold, damp perfume flowing there. He felt the prickers of trailing blackberry against his wrist. His delicate fingers found the pendulous flowers of wild bleeding heart. He recalled the first time he saw a spotted coral root, the first time he smelled deerhead orchid. He lay in the clearing until he was stiff from the night air, then got up and walked back to the house. He returned the unused flashlight to the drawer, stood reading some pages in Haskins' book, then put out the light and went upstairs. He was in bed some minutes before his wife spoke. Do you know what she found today? asked Alice. What's that? Iburophyton astinae. She took me. I'd never seen one before. Wick Coulter recalled the page in Haskin exactly, the paragraph on the phantom orchid he had memorized as a boy. It is truly a phantom for which you may seek for years, and then, when least expected, it suddenly stands before you in some dim forest aisle, a vision of soft, white loveliness that once seen can never be forgotten. Me either, he said. He felt the strained, the straight edge of his wife's hand against his thigh. You only have to ask her, she said. Yes, he answered, though it might easily come to more than that if I'm to get home. Was it night alone, sitting the open window sill? he wondered. You smell like the woods, she said. So there is a man who has come home. Well, he has the chance, I think, to come home. If he's asked his daughter's forgiveness, um, his wife has pointed out to him that he's this internationally famous man, but he doesn't know the names of the plants in his own backyard, which is what precipitates the story. His daughter knows all the plants, but asks her dad anyway because she wants to make him feel better. And I, I think at the end of the story, he realizes that the door is open. There's more than just darkness sitting in that open window. He, he went out and he tried to touch the flowers and make his peace, and he apologized to his daughter, and now I think we think he's going to apologize to his wife in another way. And the possibility for his redemption is there on the page. Whether or not it'll happen, I don't know. I think that's true in all of the stories. All of us would like to believe that given half a chance, we'd do, we'd do well. Um, and then we find ourselves in situations where we have a chance and, and we don't. In this book, you've taken a leap. In the other books, uh, your characters were in a specific landscape, yes. whether it was the desert or yes. the Arctic. This one is in a very varied landscape. They're yes. all in different landscapes. Tell us about that. Well, I, um, in so 1988 or so, six years ago, I began work on a large nonfiction book, and it necessitated a lot of travel. And as I traveled, um, I encountered these situations that, that triggered my imagination. And uh, that's where the stories, that's where this particular set of stories began to, to grow up. And so that's why the stories are set in Greenland and in Australia and in Mexico and in New York City. And there's a story set in Oregon where I live and I think a couple of stories mm -hmm. set in, in Idaho. Um, although I don't ever mention Idaho, I think that's sort of mm -hmm. where they're where they happen to be set. Um, and I, the book came to be called Field Notes because they seem to be stories that grew out of uh, places far from my own home. I'm fascinated by the triggers. And before we uh, sat down to talk, uh, you spoke about uh, not going to Greenland, but watching Greenland, seeing yes, Greenland. Yes, I had, when I was working on Arctic Dreams, I had learned about Arctic oases, these places that are 
in the very in the in very high latitudes, 82 degrees north, but where summer arrived early and lingered, and so you would be if you're traveling cross country, you're traveling through areas that to our eyes in the middle latitudes look very bleak, and then you come upon these places that look lush and you. They seem s they seem like uh, a mirage almost, uh, an Edenic landscape. Mm -hmm. So I knew the place in in Peeryland, uh, called Peeryland in northern Greenland, existed. And then in 1988, in August of 1988, I was working with three archaeologists at an archaeological site on the east coast of Ellesmere Island at about 80 degrees north. And after our supper meal in the evening, I would sit and look out across the water at Greenland which, uh, given the clarity of the air, uh, I could see that these high bluffs that were on the west coast of Greenland. And it became, an a, a, it attracted me, it attracted my imagination. So I had that, that book-learned information about an Arctic oasis, and I had this emotional response to this exotic place. And four years down the line, they came together at s in some way, and then this story called Peeryland in, in Field Notes is got, uh, just, just came to life. Um, I, I don't, I've never had an intention in sitting down to write a short story. I, I would be suspicious of my motives if I did. I, I, I think that you just give in to the story and the characters and the landscape and the situation carries itself mm -hmm. forward and you, you serve it and then the story ends. And when you go back to rewrite, you're more conscious of what's there, and you begin to see, oh, I get a feeling for what this story might be about. So you sharpen the language with an eye to that. And of course, all the reviewers talk about your work as being spare. Yes. And I'm fascinated by the sort of that lapidary, the, the way that it's honed down to yes. diamond points. I, that's what, for me, I mean, it, it's important always to emphasize that different writers work to different, in different ways, and different readers respond to writers for different reasons. The way that, that suits me is to keep cutting away at the language until I, till, until I feel every single word is doing something. I, I know that people have said to me that, that, um, that something on the order of the activity in a novel can occur in a short story of mine in 15 or 20 pages. And I think part of the reason for that is that uh, a friend of mine, a good, a good close friend, says, Barry, you'll never be a novelist because you don't know how to skate. He said, you don't know how to just write pages of <laughs> prose that are just skating along. We're not getting anywhere, but it's lovely. And he says, the other reason you'll never be a novelist is you don't hate people enough. He said, You've, you're never able to create characters and then just destroy them and throw them away. He said, you think life is too, <laughs> is too precious. So I hope I'm able to prove him wrong one day by writing uh, what were for me would be a lengthy novel, 150 pages or something, <laughs> and in, in, which, uh, in which people um, uh, are not uh, wadded up and thrown mm -hmm. away in order to advance the plot. You've also talked about the discipline that writing essays and magazine articles yes. have, that you're, re you're really stuck. I mean, you've got that 5,000 words and it can't be yes. six or four. I don't think of it as being stuck. It's like telling uh, somebody there has to be mm -hmm. 16 lines in a sonnet mm -hmm. or or telling uh, uh, a, mu a musician mm -hmm. who's going to work in a classical mm -hmm. form like the symphony that there have to be four mm -hmm. movements. It's just a form. The, the only mm -hmm. thing that I rebel against as a writer is if s uh, someone comes to me and we agree that we'd like to work together and they say they would like this piece to be 5,000 words, then what I say is I will make this piece of furniture and I will move it so that it's complete like that in 5,000 words. But when it's complete and you come to me and you say you want it 6,000 or you want it 4,000, it's like coming to somebody who's made a chair and saying, well, we'll just fix this by cutting the legs off by two inches. No, you have to start all over again. You have to start all over again and redesign it. If you don't, then what you're supplying the reader with is information, and information is not a story. Uh, was it easy or difficult for you to let uh, Crone Weasel out of your hands and become a play? Um, given the people I worked with uh, at the Children's Theatre Company here in Minneapolis, um, I was, I think, as reluctant because of the nature of the material to let go uh, of this material as any writer is. I could imagine if somebody came to me and said, I would like to adapt a short story for the stage, I would have been much less concerned. But Crow and Weasel is material that grew up out of 25 years of traveling with indigenous people. 
and out of respect for indigenous people, I could not let the material go without finding some way to supervise it. And the blessing of it was the, the, the level of commitment and intelligence and insight mm -hmm. at, the, um, at the children's theater, where we all worked mm -hmm. together, and I was able to learn how to have make a statement that was useful and then back up and not get in the way of the, of the whole process, I hope. Um, so no, I, I, I felt that I was handed the best people uh, to make that book a play. Um, it was like, uh, I, I, I did not have to go in at the bottom level and work my way all See, up. But you still had to establish those relationships and be willing to let go. Yes, and, and, and I, I think you let go with people who are imaginative and respectful of the material. Um, th and they may end up respecting you, too. But it, th the most important thing is respect for the sources, respect for the material. And when I, Crow and Weasel is a story told my, by me. I, I am uh, uh, an Anglo-American man whose traditional training was in, in universities that, that were, were structured according to the dictates of Western philosophy. But so much of what I've learned in my life, I've learned from indigenous people. And it is, it is sacrilegious of me to take what was given to me and throw it away or allow it to be used in a disrespectful manner. I want to ask you just in the last minute about uh, helping we interlopers live more comfortably in the landscape of our own country. Um, I, I, I don't think of us as interlopers. We're, we are all human beings, and one way or another, uh, we're here. And this is, this is our home. This is where we live, and we must, make, um, we must make good and moral relationships with the place. But sometimes we make it uneasy. The, the clear-cutting, the drift nets. Yes, well, we behave like barbarians, and we've been trying to, be rid of, we're trying to rid ourselves of that for, for centuries, and, and we're not going to do it tomorrow. Um, but if we don't do it by day after tomorrow, I think we're going to pay the, the so-called ultimate price. Uh, uh, you know, 25 years of wandering around on the surface of the earth has taught me a lot of things, and one of them is that we are dispensable. Um, I've spent weeks in the interior of Antarctica. There is no biology mm -hmm. in the middle of Antarctica, and it's not necessary. You sense that momentary presence. W and if, if we don't, no one is going to save us but ourselves, and if we don't save ourselves, um, our children will have us to blame. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. Barry Lopez, his most recent book is Field Notes, just published by Knopf. I'm Steve Benson. presentation of the Hennepin County Library.